Thank you so much, Kay, and thank you for those uh, nice uh, words, and thank you for introducing me, and it's uh, really a great uh, pleasure and honor to be here uh, today. And uh, I have visited uh, the United States many times as Secretary General of NATO, but this is my first visit to Texas as Secretary General of NATO, and I think that was about time to come here, uh, uh, not least because I'm able to go here together with uh, Ambassador K. Uh, Bailey Hutchinson, which, uh, uh, and who is really a strong supporter of NATO. And, uh, and uh, I really appreciate working together with her uh, in NATO. And uh, she, said, uh, she said many nice words about me, but uh, you have to know that I appreciate very much to working with her uh, because she brings uh, a wealth of wisdom and experience from Texas, but also from uh, the U.S. Senate uh, and uh, this, uh, her knowledge and her wisdom and her political experience is of great importance for the Alliance because we need U.S. leadership and uh, uh, she is uh, showing that leadership by uh, her excellent work uh, in Brussels. So it's great to be with you here in Texas. Then uh, I like to be here or it's great to be here today for uh, actually uh, several reasons. Uh, one reason is that I uh, very much like academic institutions uh, because uh, many, many years ago I decided to not become a politician. Uh, I decided to uh, pursue a an academic career. Uh, after I finished my exams in economics in, at the University of Oslo, I started to work uh, at the University of Oslo and, at the, and in the Central Bureau of Statistics in Norway uh, because my plan was to become a professor in uh, mathematics or econometrics uh, and I started that and then I was asked to become a deputy minister or state secretary in the Ministry of Environment back in 1990 and I promised myself and my wife to do that for maximum a couple of years and then go back to the academic life and uh, become a professor. I yeah, know I, I feel because now I've been in politics for almost 30 years uh, and I'm afraid that the academic career is uh, it's very hard to go back uh, and to start again to do especially econometrics. Uh, partly because I've forgotten everything. Uh, <laughs> and, and even if I was able to, what should I say, relearn that, I think uh, there is no way I'm able to compete with people who are 19 or 20 or 25 or one year old. I, I, I will lose. So, so I, I know my limitations, uh, <coughs> so I think that uh, econometrics um, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, is a lost career. Um, but, but instead of then becoming an academic myself, I really like visiting academic institutions and therefore I like to, uh, I appreciate really to be here, to, to see the, uh, to, 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 to sense the atmosphere, to, to, to know that the SMU uh, is really a center of uh, academic excellence uh, for more than 100 years and, uh, and the scientific work and the teaching which is taking place here is uh, something which is highly recognized uh, and, uh, and therefore uh, it is a special um, pleasure for me uh, to uh, visit uh, SMU. Also knowing that uh, this university has um, uh, had as students, senators, congressmen and even a first lady, uh, they have walked uh, the quadrangle, uh, I think it is, uh, and, uh, and therefore this is uh, an academic institution with uh, a lot of proud uh, history. Uh, so that's the second reason why I think it's great to be here in Texas and at uh, the SMU. The third reason is of course that I, it provides me an opportunity to <coughs> share with you some thoughts and some reflections on uh, uh, the challenges uh, NATO uh, is facing and how we are responding to them and that is important for Europe but it's of also of great importance for North America and the United States. NATO is the most successful military alliance in history and the main reason why NATO is the most successful alliance in, the, uh, in history is that we have been able to change, to adapt when the world is changing. And as many of you already know, uh, NATO was established uh, on the 4th of April 1949, so almost exactly, exactly 69 years ago. Um, uh, for 40 years, from 1949 to 1989, uh, we did only actually uh, one thing, and that was to uh, 
uh, deliver credible deterrence uh, uh, against the Soviet Union. Uh, it was uh, all about how to make sure that the Soviet in Union didn't attack any NATO allied country. And we did that quite successfully, based on the core principle of NATO, that, uh, which is one for all and all for one. So if one NATO ally is attacked, then it will trigger the response from uh, the whole alliance. From uh, then it was 12 members, today it's uh, 29 members. And by having this one for all, all for one principle, uh, we have been able to uh, uh, prevent any attack against any NATO ally. And that's extremely important for all of us, but especially for small NATO allies, as for instance Norway, where I'm, where I'm coming from, it was of great importance to know that when we shared, uh, we are sharing, Norway is sharing a border with Russia and previously with Soviet Union, five million people close to uh, a big nation, the Soviet Union and, and Russia la later on. But we felt safe because we knew that if Norway was attacked, NATO, NATO allies, the United States, they will come uh, to our support. And as long as any potential adversary is certain that we will defend each other, they will not attack. So the best way to prevent conflict is to have credible deterrence. And that's exactly what NATO did for 40 years, 49 to 89. Then in 89, the Berlin Wall came down and the Cold War ended and uh, Russia, no, no, sorry, the Soviet Union and, uh, and the Warsaw Pact uh, uh, were dissolved. And then people started to ask, do we need NATO anymore? Uh, because the main reason why NATO was established didn't exist anymore. And it was, uh, some commentators said that uh, NATO either had to go out of area, meaning go out of NATO territory in Europe, or uh, out of business. And then NATO decided not to go out of business, but instead uh, go out of area. And for the first time in our history, we, um, we went beyond NATO borders. We uh, helped to end two wars in the Balkans in the 1990s, in Bosnia-Herzegovina and in Serbia, uh, Kosovo. And later on, uh, we uh, launched our big, uh, biggest military operation ever in Afghanistan as a response to a, a terrorist attack on the United States, 9-11. And as uh, Kay just said, um, that is the first and only time we have invoked uh, what we call Article 5, uh, which is the collective defense clause of uh, our founding treaty, the Washington uh, Treaty, which says that an attack on one ally should, uh, shall be considered an attack on all allies. So then for <coughs> as the first 40 years, where we successfully deterred the Soviet Union and we were able to end the Cold War without firing a shot, uh, but without moving beyond our borders. Then 25 years from 89 to 2014, we did what we call crisis management beyond our borders, in the Balkans, in Afghanistan, fighting piracy off the Horn of Africa. So we did crisis management, management uh, uh, beyond NATO borders. Then 2014 is a new pivotal year uh, in the history of NATO. Because in 2014, two things happened at the same time. Partly, we saw uh, even more assertive Russia. Uh, we saw the illegal annexation of Crimea which uh, is the first time since the uh, Second World War uh, when borders are changed in Europe uh, by the use of force of one uh, country, uh, Russia, taking a part of another country, Ukraine, by annexing Crimea. So that was extremely serious. Second, they continue to destabilize uh, eastern Ukraine. And we have, uh, and we saw over, over a long period of time, uh, 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 Russia, which heavily invested in more military equipment, modernized, the, the modernized their armed forces, uh, 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 also invested heavily in nuclear uh, 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 systems. Uh, and, and then 2014 was this uh, year they really started to use military force against uh, a, a neighbor. Then at, in the same year, 2014, something very different happened and that was uh, the rise of Daesh or ISIL. And after, I, mean, I remember when I was asked to become Secretary General of NATO in uh, January 2014, the first time, uh, then uh, hardly anyone had heard about ISIL or Daesh. Some months later, Daesh controlled territory close to NATO borders in Iraq and Syria, 
as big as the United Kingdom and almost 8 million people. So that was really a threat. And uh, NATO proved again that we are able to adapt, able to uh, respond, and we responded uh, by implementing the biggest reinforcement of collective defense since the end of the Cold War and by stepping up our efforts to fight terrorism. So I'm actually quite impressed by the fact that NATO has proven again and again able to change, respond when uh, the world is changing. And I will just uh, briefly, and then I will be available for, for, for questions, um, uh, uh, describe uh, how we have then uh, once again changed or adapted in the light of what happened in 2014 and after. Uh, first, the biggest reinforcement of collective defense. We have for the first time in our history deployed combat re ready troops in the eastern part of the alliance. We call them battle groups. One is led by the United States in Poland, then the United Kingdom, uh, Canada and Germany. They lead other battle groups. But together this is the strongest military presence NATO has ever had in the eastern part of the alliance. The battle groups are not very big, it's around 1,000 uh, in each. But the important thing is that they are multinational. So there are NATO troops already in the Baltic countries, sending an extremely clear and uh, strong message that if anything similar to what happened in Ukraine happens against any of the Baltic countries, NATO will be there and responding immediately. So there is no way that can happen without the triggering the response from the whole alliance. That provides deterrence, and that's extremely important for especially the Baltic countries and, and, and Poland. Second, we have increased the readiness of our forces. So we have tripled the size of what we call the NATO response force, which is a uh, yeah, force uh, around 40,000 troops, which are available uh, and we can deploy them uh, on very short uh, notice. And thirdly, uh, we have seen for the first time in many, many years that uh, uh, defense spending is again increasing. Especially, as uh, the United States have already, has always spent a lot on defense. It has been a bit up and down, but three, four percent, more than that, actually, uh, uh, always. Uh, uh, but uh, since the end of the Cold War, uh, during the 1990s and up till 2014, we have seen a quite steady decline in defense spending across Europe and Canada. Then in 2014, NATO allies decided as a response to what we saw with Russia in uh, Ukraine, Crimea, and the rise of Daesh in Iraq, Syria, that we needed to invest more. And we decided to stop the cuts, uh, uh, gradually increase, and then move towards spending 2% of GDP on defense within a decade. We decided that in 2014, and the first year after our decision, 2015, was the first year with uh, increase in defense spending across Europe and Canada for many, many years. And then and now we have, we have had three consecutive years of uh, a rise, uh, as a rising um, defense expenditures in, uh, uh, among Europe, uh, European allied countries and Canada. That is extremely important because it shows that we are willing to invest more in our security when the world requires that. Second, it is also a message to the United States that the European allies are stepping up and we take it seriously that we need a more balanced burden sharing. We still have a long way to go, but at least European allies and Canada has turned a corner uh, showing that uh, uh, they will carry their part of the burden and are investing more uh, in uh, defense. Um, uh, the other element of our adaptation is that we have uh, uh, decided to do more in the fight against terrorism. All NATO allies are members of what we call the US-led global coalition to defeat ISIS. It has achieved a lot already. Almost all the territory controlled by uh, Daesh or ISIL uh, in Iraq and Syria has been retaken. Um, um, and uh, all allies have participated, but just to mention, Turkey has been key in that fight. Because sometimes we remember, uh, we, it's easy to forget that Iraq and Syria, Daesh, is actually at the border of NATO, because n Turkey is a NATO country. Uh, and we know that this is not only, only, only a threat against neighbors like Turkey, but it's a threat against all of us, because we have seen terrorist attacks 
in the United States, in Europe, organized or inspired by Daesh, the so-called caliphate they tried to establish in uh, Iraq and, uh, and Syria. So this is not only about protecting the neighbors of Iraq and Syria, but also protecting uh, all our uh, countries. Um, um, uh, so, so Turkey has been key because they have provided infrastructure, air bases uh, in the fight against uh, uh, Daesh. I think that the lesson we have learned uh, being very different in Iraq, uh, um, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Libya, uh, other places, is that NATO and NATO allied countries have to be ready to deploy large number of combat troops in big combat operations as we for instance did in Afghanistan after 9-11, the attack on the United States. But in the long run it is better to train local forces to enable them to stabilize their own country. And that's exactly what we are doing in Afghanistan. Uh, we have trained the Afghans so they are now uh, responsible for the security in their own country. And when the Taliban attacks, or when there are terrorist attacks in Kabul or elsewhere in Afghanistan, it is the Afghan special forces who, who goes out and respond. We help them, we support them, we train them, we, we advise them, but they are on the front line. And that is uh, a great achievement that we are able to train and build local Afghan forces uh, capable of doing exactly uh, that. We are aiming to do the same in Iraq, uh, therefore we are now in the process of planning a to scale up and to establish a training mission, a uh, NATO training mission, to train the Iraqi forces, to build their security institutions, again uh, uh, based on the idea that prevention is better than intervention and that uh, in the long run we are safer if they are able to stabilize their own uh, countries. It's not easy, we need different approaches to different countries, but our efforts to fight terrorism is very much about building local uh, capacity. Then of course we also um, have to address um, other threats like cyber threats and the proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons, North Korea. Uh, we fundamentally, when it comes to uh, nuclear and ballistic missile threats, we respond in the same way as we have responded to ballistic and missile threats for decades by deterrence. NATO, and again the United States, is the biggest ally. Uh, we have the resolve, we have the capabilities to respond if attacked. And that has, that has been uh, the best way to uh, prevent the Soviet Union or Russia to attack. And I think also it sends a clear message to North Korea. At the same time we work for a political solution. So we support all efforts to try to find a political solution to the crisis uh, caused by the development of uh, nuclear weapons and, 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 and ballistic missiles in North Korea. And to uh, be able to reach a political solution uh, we need strong pressure on North Korea and therefore also we strongly support the, um, uh, the economic sanctions against uh, uh, North uh, uh, Korea. Um, I will just share with you uh, also then, uh, then we one, one reflection and then I will uh, end and, and open up for questions. And that is that the, the, the one of the challenges we face today is that it is a much more blurred line between peace and war. Uh, than we have seen before. In the old days, war was something a nation declared. The amb ambassadors went to the capitals and said, we now declare a war against your country. And it was easy to say exactly when the war started and when it uh, was over or ended. Uh, and in my country, Norway, we know exactly when the Second World War started. It started the 9th of April, when we were attacked by German forces, and it ended the 8th of May. And that was a clear date. And we knew exactly which countries that were neutral and which countries which were part of the Second World War. Norway, Denmark, we were part of the Second World War. Sweden was not. When it comes to today, we see threats which are extremely different. For instance, the fight against Daesh and, uh, and, uh, and ISIL, it's very hard to say when it started. It's very uh, hard to say exactly where it takes place. We know that it has taken place in Iraq and Syria, but it has also taken place in our own streets, in our own capitals. And there are different groups claiming to be part of ISIL. We don't know exactly whether how, how close the connections are, uh, but we know there are several terrorist attacks which are more or less linked to Daesh. So, so, so the war takes place also in, in that sense in our own streets. Uh, then 
uh, of course, Iraq and Syria, but we, we, we have Daesh in Afghanistan, in North Africa, in Asia. And we have Daesh operating in cyberspace. And I think it's very hard to tell when the fight against Daesh is over. So <laughs> classical old kinds of war, they, they were well defined in time and space. Today, war is hard to define when and where. And we have a very blurred line because there are what we call hybrid tactics, which is a mixture of military and non-military means of aggression, covert and overt operations, cyber uh, interventions. Um, we saw souls produce of a, a chemical uh, um, nerve agent, uh, and so on. This is a great challenge for NATO because we have to be strong, we have to respond, but we have to respond in a measured way, and sometimes attribution is extremely difficult, especially when it comes to cyber attacks. So that's also the reason why we are modernizing the alliance, not only by strengthening our conventional forces, uh, but also by more intelligence, uh, better situational awareness, higher readiness, and for instance, investing more uh, both in cyber uh, defense, but also in uh, our capabilities to deal with chemical weapons and uh, other uh, types of weapons of mass uh, destruction. Um, I will just end by saying that I'm optimistic on behalf of NATO uh, uh, because uh, NATO is uh, strong uh, because of our uh, because we have proven able to uh, to adapt. And the impressive thing is that despite of the uh, consensus we uh, need, because as Kay said, that's sometimes quite demanding to reach consensus 29 allies, we have been able to take uh, decisions. And for instance, we were able to invoke Article 5 just hours after the attack on the United States. We, we, we were able to, uh, to, to, to take over the responsibility for the uh, uh, air operations of, of Libya within days. Uh, we have high readiness forces, so we can take decisions uh, uh, fast or quickly if uh, needed. But I strongly believe that the fact that NATO has proven able to change and the fact that we have been uh, able to stand united for almost 70 years provides the best basis for that NATO will continue to be the most successful alliance in history. Good for Europe and good for North America and the United States. Thank you so much.